Welcome to our afternoon session. Our afternoon sessions will work in this format. There will be three main, uh, the three main positions presented. Every presenter will have um, a segment of time to present. Then there will be a response, an official response to the presentation. And then there will be a brief time for questions. Following that format for the next three hours, there will also be inserted about a five minute break, which isn't a lot of time. We're hoping that uh, you are so blessed and benefited by listening that uh, you can find your way back in here, but we're gonna try to stay on schedule best we can. The last hour, so we're gonna go two, three, four with the three main presentations. The last hour, we're going to have three segments that didn't make it into our Friday uh, dialogue. So yesterday, the presenters, a number of the presenters, most all were here, and we had some uh, individual presentations. We're going to bring three of those in the last hour from 5 to 6. At 7 o'clock, we will, at 6 o'clock, we'll have another meal for you, a light meal. And at 7 o'clock, we'll have a panel discussion and uh, some questions and answers. So this is how the program will function this afternoon. It'll roll just like this. If you have a question, we're asking that you keep your questions short. And to the point, if you have a comment, that's okay, as long as your comment is short and to the point. And uh, we will see how God leads us. Now, we have sought to have a beautiful, respectful, collegial spirit about this. We know that there are a variety of different opinions here. But we've been blessed thus far. Were you blessed this morning? Amen. Yeah, amen. And so we're thankful to all who have presented thus far. So we're going to take the journey forward now, and uh, we are going to... Uh, here, a presentation. What's our first one, Dr. Vine? The Neo Uriah okay, we're going to go to the Neo Uriah Smith view. So, gentlemen, we are ready. Well, good afternoon. Before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we invite your spirit to be here to lead us into all truth. I pray that our hearts will be open to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, that would be the wrong uh, PowerPoint. We want John Whitcomb's PowerPoint. Okay, stop the clock. All right, there we are. Eastern question. On the golden princess? Well, let me begin by defining terms. The Eastern question in Bible prophecy was a prophetic lecture on Daniel 11, 40 through 45, presented in public meetings by early Adventist pioneers and evangelists such as General Conference President A.G. Daniels and noted author and publishing house editor Uriah Smith. The contents of this lecture were outlined in our denomination's publications, Bible Readings for the Home Circle and Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation. In this book, the King of the North, or in this lecture, the King of the North and the King of the South were interpreted to be literal political powers operating in the theater of the Middle East. North was identified as Turkey and South as Egypt. This was the lecture that our evangelists and pastors used as a means to bring attention of the world to the Seventh-day Adventist message. We have located over 850 newspaper articles from the late 1800s up until the first half of the 20th century that reported on the presentation of this lecture. 
In 1884, Ellen White wrote the following report regarding a presentation on the prophecies of Daniel 11, 40 through 45. The evening meeting was largely attended. Elder Smith spoke with great clearness, and many listened with open eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future. Would the same presentation in 2018 elicit the same response? Which brings me to the definition of the Golden Princess. Last month, my family sent my wife and myself on an all-expense-paid 12-day princess cruise from Los Angeles to Alaska. After a few days at sea, I gave the ship's entertainment director a copy of my book, Jerusalem Caliphate and the Third Jihad, along with a copy of a poster advertising a prophetic lecture on Daniel 11.45 that I had given several months ago at the Radisson Hotel in Helena, Montana. I told the entertainment director that I would be willing to present this lecture on his ship. The poster reads, The Battle for Jerusalem. The United States President Donald Trump declared that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. Mohammed declared that Jerusalem was to be the final capital of the Islamic Caliphate, the capital of Islam. So whose capital? Islam's or Israel's? A prophecy in Daniel 11.45 answered this question 2,500 years ago, and the answer may surprise you. Now, if you know anything about the nature of, inter of the entertainment found on a cruise ship, there was little chance, very little chance, that the ship would allow such a lecture to be presented. Was I ever surprised when I received the message that I was scheduled to speak at one of the ship's premier venues? The ship publishes a daily paper that is delivered to every stateroom on the ship first thing in the morning. It provides an hourly uh, schedule of the day's activities. Now here's the wording that they came up with to advertise my lecture. 3.15 p.m. lecture, Jerusalem Caliphate and the Third Jihad. Join fellow guest and author, Pastor John Whitcomb, for this lecture. <clears throat> Discover what Bible prophecy reveals regarding the end game for the city of Jerusalem. Explorers Lounge, Deck 7, Midship. Now the lounge was packed with several hundred guests for the lecture that I entitled, The Battle for Jerusalem. Engaging from the applause, along with the written and verbal comments, it was evident that that 45-minute lecture was very well received. One guest wrote me a note telling me that this lecture was the talk of the dinner table that evening. The entertainment director thanked me on three separate occasions. He had noticed that the meeting was largely attended and that I spoke with great clearness and many listened with open eyes, ears, and mouths. The entertainment director noticed that the ship's guests seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. An elite status guest who had been on scores of cruises all around the world working as a cruise entertainer let me know how unusual it was for a cruise ship to allow a biblically based lecture to be held in one of the main lounges of the ship. He had never seen the likes. He too saw the interest of the people and encouraged me to offer this lecture on other cruise lines. <laughs> now. A young woman came up to me just before we disembarked back in Los Angeles and told me the following story. 
Her mother and her aunt were traveling with her on this cruise. They came to the lecture and guessed that I must be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, perhaps because I mentioned Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation. They left a message on my stateroom phone asking if I would conduct a Sabbath church service on the ship. I checked with the ship and they made the arrangements for me to do this. The prophetic lecture coupled with the Sabbath sermon reached the heart of this young woman's aunt who had left the Seventh-day Adventist church many years ago. The niece recognized that her aunt was not the same lady that got on the ship. Her aunt told her that it was divine providence that brought them on this cruise. This young professional emailed me a few days ago, quote, if you plan to hold any type of seminar or Bible study groups in the future on cruise ships, please let us know so we can see if booking is an option for our family. But the interest of the people and lives being affected doesn't prove that the Eastern question in Bible prophecy lecture is biblical truth. Perhaps the lecture I gave was a Jesuit-inspired teaching, as Louis Weir claimed in regard to the Eastern Question view held by Elder Uriah Smith. Maybe the King of the North in verse 45 has nothing to do with Turkey and is really the papacy, and perhaps the King of the South in verse 40 is not the leader of Egypt, but rather represents atheism or Islam. Is there a way to know for certain whether or not the Eastern question that was taught for over 80 years in our church is indeed prophetic truth. If we were left solely to our own interpretive abilities to understand Daniel 11, 40 through 45, we could expect to see a multiplicity of views with everyone believing that their view is the correct understanding. And that is exactly where we are today. The founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, coming from various denominations, were just as divided on their understanding of doctrinal issues as those of us here are divided on our understanding of Daniel 11. Reporting on one of the 22 Sabbath conferences that were held between 1848 and 1850, where our doctrinal positions were hammered out, Ellen White wrote, Our first meet general meeting in western New York, beginning August 18, was held at Volney in Brother David Arnold's barn. About 35 were present, present all the friends that could be collected in that part of the state. But of this number, there were hardly two agreed. Some were holding serious errors, and each strenuously urged his own views, declaring that they were according to scriptures. Life Sketches, page 110. Hardly two agreed? Does that sound familiar? If it was not for God's intervention back then, I doubt that there would have ever been unity. But God promised in his word that he would intervene. By what means? Listen to what Ellen White stated. I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as a rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has, in that word, promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. Early Writings, page 78. Here is Ellen White's report on how this promised intervention worked for the brethren back in 1848. Again, quote, again and again, these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 206. 
Ellen White also stated, quote, they knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as light, direct from heaven, the revelations given me. The leading points of our faith as we hold them today were firmly established point after point was clearly defined and all the brethren came into harmony. This day with God, page 317. The most important question for us to answer this afternoon is, did God give to Ellen White any indication as to whether or not the Eastern question in Bible prophecy was biblical truth. If he did, then for those who will allow the inspiration of the Holy Spirit working through the ministry of Ellen White to correct their interpretation of the Bible, it is possible that all of us brethren assembled here today could come into harmony. If God did not speak through his prophet regarding the last six verses of Daniel 11, then unity of interpretation will be impossible to achieve. I'm going to make a case this afternoon that God was not silent on the Eastern question. So follow me closely. Quote, there must be no long discussions, no presenting of new theories in regard to prophecies that God has already made plain. Review and Herald, November 27, 1900. How can we know if Ellen White is including the prophecy of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, as one of the prophecies that God has already made plain, thus barring the presentation of new theories on these verses. Here is my evidence that the Eastern question is prophetic truth that God had already made plain to his church. Ellen White wrote, Elder Daniels speaks this evening upon the Eastern question. May the Lord give his Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to make the truth plain. Manuscript 189, 1898. God's Holy Spirit could not have made the truth of the Eastern question plain to the hearts of the listeners unless it was prophetic truth that God had already made plain to his church. When was it made plain to our church? It was made plain during a 10-year period of time, 1862 to 1872, when a thorough investigation of the books of Daniel and Revelation was made by our church. Ellen White speaks of this inv investigation. Quote, while the people who are anxious for truth have been calling watchmen what of the night, the answer has been given intelligently. The morning cometh and also the night. By a thorough investigation of the prophecies, we understand where we are in this world's history and we know for a certainty that the second coming of Christ is near. The result of these investigations must be brought before the world through the press. Testimonies, Volume 4, 592. Our press rolled out the results of that inv investigation. Over a million copies of Daniel and the Revelation were printed in several languages. Regarding the leader of this thorough investigation, Ellen White wrote, God used the author, Uriah Smith, of this book, Daniel and the Revelation, as a channel through which to communicate light to direct minds to the truth. Manuscript Release, Volume 1, page 63. Perhaps it is no coincidence that on two separate occasions, God led Ellen White to call the Eastern question in Bible prophecy truth. It is in Uriah Smith's book, which Ellen White labeled, quote, God's Helping Hand, where we find the truth regarding the Eastern question in Bible prophecy plainly laid out. Quote, those who are preparing to enter the ministry who desire to become successful, successful what? <laughs> Just a minute. Stu 
students of the prophecies will find Daniel and the Revelation an invaluable help. They need to understand this book. It speaks of past, present, and future, laying out the path so plainly that none need err therein. The great essential questions which God would have presented to the people are found in Daniel and Revelation. There is found solid, eternal truth for this time. Everyone needs the light and information it contains. That's why I could stand there on the cruise ship and present with power the presentation of the Eastern question because I know it's biblical truth. I know that I can present what is found in this book and I'm not going to be teaching error. Now in closing, let me summarize. God made the interpretation of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, plain to our church during that 10 year investigation of the prophecies when God channeled the prophetic light through Uriah Smith as he led that group of able Bible students in a thorough investigation of Daniel and Revelation. And I base this conclusion upon the fact that Ellen White prayed for the Holy Spirit to make the truth of the Eastern question plain to the listening audience. Ellen White would not have prayed for the Holy Spirit to make the truth of the Eastern question plain to the listeners unless she knew that it was prophetic truth that God had already made plain to his church. Now let me bring home the import of this conclusion to this conference here today. Because God had indeed already made plain the Eastern Question Bible prophecy, we must not present new theories on the prophecy of Daniel 11, 40 through 45. So why all the new theories? Well, before July 16, 2015, when the White Estate released several previously unpublished manuscripts, we did not have access to the significant statement regarding Ellen White's Manuscript 189 prayer for the truth of the Eastern question to be made plain. And without a word from God's messenger to correct those who err from Bible truth, everyone rightfully felt free to develop and promote their own private interpretation of this prophecy. We were all ignorant of this statement because it had not been released by the White Estate. But now that we have read this statement, what are we going to do with it? We could ignore it explain it away, and continue presenting new theories on this important prophecy. But if we do so, wouldn't we be making of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God? We have been warned. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish or are in confusion, you could say. We must not fall for this deception. We should allow this statement to bring us into unity so that God's church can once again speak with a united prophetic voice on this crucial, critical prophecy. Ellen White believed that Uriah Smith's interpretation of Daniel 11 represented divine truth. If we accept Smith's understanding, because it is endorsed by Ellen White, will we then be in opposition to principles of sound hermeneutics? Not at all. And in my paper posted on the conference website, I demonstrate that our pioneer's understanding of Daniel 11 is indeed based on sound principles of prophetic interpretation. The paper is entitled, uh, A Literal King of the South. In this paper, I've updated Uriah Smith's interpretation of verse 45, taking into account the current geopolitical conditions of the Middle East. Our pioneers' under understanding of Daniel 11 was indeed based on sound principles of prophetic interpretation. I believe that Daniel 11:45 is soon to be fulfilled, and God desires his church to give powerful public witness to this prophecy before its fulfillment. The Eastern question in Bible prophecy is present truth that we must share with the world. So if I am ever sent on another cruise, 
I'm going to request the ship's theater as the venue for my Eastern question in Bible prophecy. <clears throat> now, tomorrow morning at 10, right here at the Village Church in the Reese Chapel, I'll be presenting a message revealing a counterfeit Eastern question message that is currently sweeping the evangelical community, preparing the world for Satan's personation of Christ. A free lunch will be provided too. <laughs> Thank you, Brother John. Remember, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. So we're going to keep our 20 minutes really, really careful here. All right, Ken LeBrun is going to now give us a 20-minute presentation. And then if there is someone from our presenter group, from either the papacy atheism position or the Islam position that wants to make some responses, when we're done, when Ken's done, we need you ready to go. Otherwise, we'll open the floor for questions. All right? All right, Ken. In addition to my full paper, which is on the Daniel11prophecy.com website, I also have there a verse-by-verse, -verse, interlinear, you might say, uh, so you can see what, uh, what I am teaching on each of the verses down through. In addition to that, uh, the, the websites on the, the screen give uh, additional material that I have on the subject thoughtlines.org and BibleProphecyCentral.com. Well, uh, the th subject of my um, presentation that I'm going to be uh, talking about is identifying the King of the South through a natural reading of Daniel 11. You see, I believe that this discussion of hermeneutics, what is the uh, proper method of interpretation, we don't really have to wonder uh, what is the proper method of interpretation because we've actually been told what the uh, proper method of interpretation is. Uh, in Great Controversy, page 599, it says, the language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Uh, and then it says, take the Bible as it reads. So we don't need to wonder uh, what, what it means uh, and um, just take it according to its obvious meaning. Now, in uh, Review and Herald, November 25, 1884, uh, Ellen White said this. She said, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. Now, this statement was made just three months after her report on uh, Elder Smith's presentation on the Eastern Question, where she said that it was being delivered with great clearness on these great events in the near future. That was just three months prior to this, and so Elder Smith was one of those uh, preachers who were out there preaching this as a primary subject in the evangelistic meetings. And, um, and so Ellen White here says, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are using the methods that William Miller has outlined for us. She says, uh, in the little book entitled, Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study. Now, simple, you see, the average person should be able to understand the Bible. So these they should be simple, intelligent, and important rules of Bible study and interpretation. And then she lists the first five of those rules. She doesn't list them all, but she, she lists the first five of them. And then she says, the above is a portion of these rules, and in our study of the Bible, we shall all do well to heed the principles set forth. So here, God's messenger is telling us we need to heed these principles that have been set forth uh, in, in William Miller's rules. 
So let's look at just a couple of them, and I recommend that you read all of them, but we'll just look at a couple of them. Rule number 11 says, how to know when a word is used figuratively. If it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally. If not, figuratively. So that's the first uh, thing that we need to take a look at. Uh, does, does the word make sense as it stands? If it does, we must take it literally. Another rule that we could mention, rule number four, says to understand doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know, then let every word have its proper influence, and if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. So all we have to do is look at it to see, uh, does it make sense as it reads without any contradictions, and if so, we've got to go with it. So what we're going to do here in my remaining time is we're going to look at a natural reading of Daniel Levin, Daniel Levin just taking uh, it as it reads according to the natural meaning of the words, and we're going to look and we're going to ask a single question, does the natural reading work? We're going to take just a, a few of the key verses and we're going to start in, in chapter 11, verse 16 where we find a transition point. Daniel 11 verse 16 says, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Now as we look at this, this uh, he that cometh against him, we've been talking in the previous verse about the king of the north. And so now we have someone who's coming against the king of the north. And this, if you'd like to just, in a general sense, map this out, the first 15 verses have been describing things that took place in the east between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. That all takes place in the east. But in verse 16, we have the introduction of the west into the prophecy. This is not the king of the north. It's not the king of the south. It's someone else. It, he that cometh against the king of the north. And so that's, uh, this new power then is going to occupy our attention all the way down till verse 40, when once again the prophecy returns back to the east and we see what's going on with the kings of the north and the south. And the next verse we want to take a look at, another transition, comes in verse 30 where we have the ships of Kittim coming in. And as they come in, these would be the uh, Germanic barbarians that invaded into the empire and changed the nature of the empire. It says, for the ships of Kittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So we need to find out who is this he that is grieved, that uh, has indignation against the Holy Covenant, and that has intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Who is this individual or this power? Well, let's first start by asking who it cannot be. Well, first of all, it cannot be the, uh, the uh, Roman Empire, because in 476, the Roman Empire comes to its end. The, uh, in, in the West, the last, uh, the last Roman emperor was deposed in 476. So once we have the ships of Kittim coming in, once we have the barbarian invasions, it can no longer be the Roman emperor because he's gone, he's out of the picture. Uh, who else can it not be? Well, I'm going to suggest that it cannot be the papacy. Why do I say that? Well, because if you notice the nature of these barbarian tribes as they came in, uh, they were all, most of them, were Aryan tribes. If you look at the map, what you find out is that you have the Ostrogoths controlling all of Italy, and, and up beyond that, you have the Visigoths controlling Gaul and Spain. You've got the Vandals controlling North Africa. 
almost the entire territory of the Western Roman Empire was now controlled by these Aryan uh, kingdoms, these Aryan tribes who did not recognize the authority of the Bishop of Rome. And so this verse, verse 30, happens chronologically prior to the uh, establishment of the papacy in 538 but, because you have to get rid of these powers before the papacy can, um, can control. So this is prior to 538 as we'll see in the next verse. And so it has to be another power. So what power would we be talking about? Who takes over after the fall of the, of the uh, emperor in the western uh, part of the empire, who takes over as the, as the key power? Well, George Burton Adams in the book Civilization During the Middle Ages tells us that it was the Franks alone of all the German tribes who became a wide power in the general history of the Middle Ages. It is to them that the political inheritance of the Roman Empire passed. To them came the honor of taking up and carrying on, roughly to be sure, and far less extensively and effectively, but nevertheless of actually carrying on the political work which Rome had been doing. So as we look at divided Rome, the ten horns in Daniel chapter 7, it was the Franks who actually picked up the mantle of leadership and therefore the Franks become the representatives of the West in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11. Clovis was a pagan, then only the chief of about 4,000 Frankish warriors. His conversion issued in events of profound importance to mankind. History tells us that he was converted in 496 and um, this was significant because the other tribes were all Aryan. There was no Catholic uh, uh, king in Western uh, Roman Empire area that had been form formerly the Western Roman Empire. There was no Catholic king at all until Clovis's conversion. And then he became the champion. Certainly, Clovis quickly learned to combine his own interests with those of the church. And notice this, the alliance between the Pope and the Frankish kings was to have a great influence upon the history of Western Europe. And so that's what it was talking about back in verse 30 there where it says that he would have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. It was Clovis, it was the Frankish kings in their alliance with the papacy, with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, that would have a profound impact upon the history of Western Europe. Daniel 11.31 says, and arms, NIV says armed forces, shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So Clovis, uh, arms stood on his part, and his armies would do what this is describing here. Now, we can tell when this took place uh, from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 11 tells us that the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that maketh desolate took place in the year 508. This is why I said this has to happen before 538, so it can't be the papacy. And so in 508, uh, the armies of Clovis uh, took away the daily and set up the abomination that maketh desolate in the year 508. And this is what Clovis said as he embarked on that mission down to drive out the Visigoths in 507-508. He said, it grieves me to see that the Arians still possess the fairest portion of Gaul. Let us march against them with the aid of God and having vanquished the heretics, we will possess and divide their fertile provinces. So just as the text said that he would be grieved as he went forth to do this, that was the very word that he used according to Edwin, Edward Gibbon in the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Nor was his a temporary conquest. The kingdom of the West Goths had become the kingdom of the Franks. The invaders had at length arrived who were to remain. It was decided that the Franks and not the Goths 
were to direct the future destinies of Gaul and Germany, and that the Catholic faith was to be the religion of these great realms. The next verse, verse 32, says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Now, such as do wickedly against the covenant would be the same ones as in verse 30 are saying, uh, them that forsake the holy covenant. This would be the Roman pontiffs, the Catholic bishops, the popes. And so uh, he, still being the, the uh, Roman monarchs, Pepin, Charlemagne, and their successors, corrupted by flatteries the popes in, as in this alliance that they had with them. Now, when we get down to verse 36, we see a king that appears here. And this says, the king shall do according to his will. And this appears to be someone that we've already been talking about, or at least the same, the, the same power. The king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper to the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. And so who would this king be in the line? And we see that the most... Uh, obvious answer to this would be um, uh, Louis XIV, who if you study what Louis XIV did, he did exactly everything that this verse says. Uh, I'll be quoting here from a book uh, called The Huguenots or the French Reformed Church. And in here we see uh, about Louis XIV. It says, the morning after the death of Mazarin, the king assembled his council and at once silenced their anxieties and expectations with a short speech. I have called you together to say that though hitherto I have been well satisfied that my government should be conducted by the late cardinal, I intend henceforth to govern it in my own person. You will assist me with your advice when I demand it. The council was dismissed. Mazarin had educated him to be a despot. His contemporaries complained of the cardinal that he had never taught the young king to govern himself and his kingdom by religious or moral principle or motives of national policy and statesmanship. He had left him to grow up a handsome, fascinating prince in a lascivious court. His intercourse with the assembled ladies polished his manners and gave him that air and presence so charming to all that approached him. He knew how to allure and how to repel by his attitudes and countenance. His will and pleasure governed the court. Louis had never been taught gratitude to man or God. Born king, he was taught his importance to the welfare of the state. When Mazarin was dead, he felt himself delivered from all obstructions to his will. And declaring he would govern according to his own wishes, he took the position which he maintained throughout life I am the state. Louis XIV resolved that there should be unity in the Church of France and that the Church of his choice should embrace all France. It was his will. How could it be resisted? His means and effort to bring the Reformed to coalesce with the Catholic Church, ending in the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and the dispersing in a short time half a million Frenchmen to the different Protestant nations, in addition to the many thousands already forced to leave their native soil, are worthy of a condensed detail. And so, um, uh, as, we, as we notice that history tells us, and great controversy tells us, that the eradication of Protestantism from France under Louis XIV resulted in the conditions that bred the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. So, in verse 37, that's what we see in the French Revolution, the, uh, the uh, atheist movement that came in there, um, as, as is described by Uriah Smith. Uh, in verse 38 talks about the God whom his fathers knew not, and, um, and of course we know the cult of reason was established, the, uh, the goddess of reason, and so forth. What does this uh, bring us down to? How did the, the French Revolution end up? It ended up with um, someone taking a seat upon the, the throne of, of Rome, you might say, as the new emperor of New Rome, and that someone was Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon set himself up as emperor, and he brings uh, everything together back again, 
And since my time is up, I'm just going to close with this, this one slide here. Um, what we see in Napoleon is the conclusion of this Western phase, this Roman phase. In verse 16, the representative of Rome comes against the king of the north. And in verse 40, the king of the north comes against the representative of Rome as the two bookends of the west in Daniel 11. Up until verse 16, you have the east. After verse 40, you once again have the east. And so that takes us to verse 40, which is where my presentation should begin if I had the time. Uh, verse 40 then, we have uh, Napoleon. And, and the thing that I want you to notice as, as you look at the, the less, rest of the verses is, does what it says in the text actually take place? And if so, we have the natural reading. And uh, if you read Uriah Smith, uh, you'll find out how exactly that, that works out. Thank you, Ken. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to invite any of the seminar presenters from the Papacy Atheism View or Islam View, if they would like to come up and speak. They'll have to be brief comments. All right, Tim, I see you. All right, come on up from the back, Brother DeCock. And uh, we're going to ask you to keep comments or questions brief. We're not going to resolve things here. We're just going to give points of view, all right? So we have at least three, so we'll go uh, Tim Payton, Brother DeCock, and Brother Gain. All right, Tim, go right ahead. Um, is this on? Okay. Um, John, you've mentioned like four or five times about Ellen White's quote of uh, Daniel's presentation on the Eastern question. I just want to say the sentence before, you only, you only quoted two sentences, the sentence before that Ellen White um, mentions Daniel's presentation on the Eastern question. She said that Dr. Carlo was to speak on the health question. Her desire that the Lord give his Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts is obviously speaking of the presenter's hearts, not the listener's. Ella White's statement is not saying that the removal of Turkey's government to Jerusalem was the truth. Her desire was for the Holy Spirit to inspire the presenter's hearts to make the truth plain on health and the Eastern question, whatever truth there was in those subjects, clear for the people to understand. This does not imply that the removal of Turkey's government to Jerusalem was the truth. That is an assumption. This is proved by the review of Daniel's message in the Geelong Advisor. They recorded him as saying that the removal of Turkey's government to Jerusalem was imminent, that the world stood on the verge of a tremendous revolution, and that the people were being warned of an impending change, and that there was a great change impending, that was 120 years ago. His interpretation failed. His teaching was obviously wrong, and the removal of Turkey's government to Jerusalem cannot be considered the truth that Ellen White was speaking of. Okay, thank you, Tim, very much. Brother DeCock? I want to make uh, two comments. The first about uh, the Eastern question. According to what we have heard, it would seem that the explanation uh, sort of freezes the Eastern question as the Turks in all perpetuity. Well, I don't believe that's true, but if so, we are not allowed to update it to a latter-day caliphate. Uh, we must decide one way or the other, can we from then proceed and speak of a caliphate, or must we take what Sister White says literally and say, okay, that is what it's like. My other comment concerns Clovis and the papacy. I'm sorry, the papacy and the Roman Catholic belief antedates Clovis by centuries. Clovis played an important role from about AD 508 onward. It is true, he became converted and became a Roman Catholic, but the papacy antedated Clovis a long time and it did not start in 538. There is a very important prophetic period that starts in 538 and ends in 1798 
But that is something else, and I think I will leave it at that. Okay. Thank you, Brother DeKirk, Brother yeah. Gain. Very fascinating presentations. Thank you. I learned a lot. And by the way, I'm descended from those Huguenots. And in Paris, when I visited there, I went to the place. I saw where the bell was at the church for St. Bartholomew's Massacre and all of that. My uh, ancestors um, moved to England, and they became pirates. Okay, so anyway, now you know the rest of the story. Uh, may our swash never buckle. But um, as far as the, John, the um, statements of Ellen White, um, I'm not seeing her say there, um, as uh, Brother DeCock was mentioning, that the, the Eastern question is settled. What I'm hearing it is that there was truth in what Uriah Smith was presenting. She wanted this to be powerful as an evangelistic tool. Now, ad, we wouldn't say that all of the Adventist evangelism has always been accurate biblically, but it has still, for all of its flaws, like all of our flaws, it's one souls, praise the Lord. And, um, and so, I hear the fact that many souls were won and, and, and the fact that on the, on the cruise ship, this is wonderful, this is fabulous. It doesn't mean that everything is accurate biblically, but there's, there's an important core there that's very important. Ellen White endorsed also Martin Luther, William Miller. William Miller had 15 proofs for um, 1844, of which about 13 and a half were wrong. Um, if you read them, they're just, they're just eisegesis, pure eisegesis, but the one and a half make it, it works. Um, so, she, when she endorses William Miller, she's not endorsing everything that he preaches or teaches or thinks. Um, now, later on in my presentation, uh, Ken, I'm going to answer your presentation because the key in Daniel 11, aside from those anchor points um, of, that connect with chapter 8, are the pronouns, the connection of the pronouns and the way they go. And on verse 16, I don't believe that he who comes against him is anything other than um, speaking of Antiochus III, it just continues that, and then it keeps going, and you have the morphology into Rome, verse 20, and the papacy in verse, uh, in verse uh, 23, and then it just keeps on with the papacy. Uh, you're absolutely historically right that Clovis is really important, but he's not in France, I don't see in Daniel 11 at all. It's about the papacy. Uh, from then on. Anyway, that's it for now. We'll hear more later. Okay, we appreciate the timeliness of all of our responders. Now, here's what we're going to do. We are a little bit off schedule, and we do have a place for questions later in the program. We're going to make up a little bit of our time now. Ken and John are available. If during the break you want to come talk to them, we're going to take our five-minute break now. We will start at 3.05 precisely with the next segment on papacy and atheism.